Now, that brings us down to chapter 2, and we see the Moabites and God's judgment of the Moabites in the first three verses. Then we turn to the nation Israel, and that will reverse the method that the other prophets used later on. They always would mention God's judgment of Israel, and then they would mention the other nations that were surrounding them. But Amos takes up these other nations first, and then he'll mention the nation Israel, and the judgment against them will be greater. And the reason for that is quite obvious. That is that privilege always creates responsibility. Privilege creates always responsibility. That is, the more light that you have, the more responsible that you are to God. I believe that, very frankly, you and I today are more responsible to God than the people in Russia are that are denied Bibles, that are not hearing the Word of God at all. We are more responsible than they are. We today like to sit in judgment of these other nations that are around about us. But have you ever stopped to think the tremendous responsibility that you and I have today, the privilege, we say, of having the Word of God, and we thank God for that, and we boast of the fact that we have the Bible and all of that. Yes, but my friend, what are you doing about it? That's the important thing today. Are you doing anything about helping get out the Word of God today? We have a greater responsibility than any world ruler that's ever been that never heard the gospel. Now, in chapter 2, the Moabites, beginning with verse 1, "...thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Moab, and for four." And that is the prophet's way. And this man Amos, I consider him a great preacher. They broke the mole after they made him. There's just one of him. He uses unusual expressions. He says, "...not for..." Three, and not for four. Well, how many? Well, he could list a great many. This is his way of saying there were many transgressions. But he's specific with each one. He says, I will turn away its punishment because he burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. Now, that's a strange thing to say, is it not? The judgment against Moab is for injustice. In fact, for an awful spirit of revenge, after the man has been killed, the Edomites were their enemies, and after they had destroyed, that is, had got a victory over the Edomites and had killed the king, you'd think that would be it. But they even burned the bones of the king of Edom into lime. That's carrying their revenge, that revengeful spirit, even farther than it should be carried. God says, because of that, but I will send a fire upon Moab, and it will devour the palaces of Kirioth, and Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the judge from the midst of it, and I will slay all its princes with him, saith the Lord. you notice God says here that Moab shall die with tumult. That is, they go out with a big bang, and that will end the nation. And it's interesting that this proud nation was brought to extinction by Nebuchadnezzar later on, and you haven't seen a Moabite since then. But isn't it interesting that out of this heathen country there came that gentle, lovely, and beautiful girl by the name of Ruth that became the wife of Boaz, and it presents one of the loveliest books we have in the Bible, and she's in the line that leads to Jesus Christ. She's in that genealogy, by the way. And she came from Moab, of all places. They were really a heathen, pagan people with a sad and sorry beginning, and just as sad 
the tragic end as a nation. But it reveals the fact of what the grace of God can do in the life of a believer, if the believer will let him do that. But here we have the fact that we're coming now to a people that should have done better but did not do better. Now, these are the messages against the surrounding nations, that is, those that were around Israel. Now, he's going to take up God's people, but he begins with Judah, and the first is against the southern kingdom, and he came from down there. And verse 4, I'm reading now, Thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Judah, and for four I will turn away its punishment. Now, in other words, again, God could enumerate many for which they were guilty, but here is the chief one. Because they have despised the law of the Lord, and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err, after which their fathers have walked. Now, he says, But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now, this is saying in a very brief way what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel took quite a few pages to say. That is, that God would judge the southern kingdom of Judah that went into Babylonian captivity, that he would judge it for what? They did not keep the commandments of God. They despised God's law. Now, Judah had the law of God and despised it. Temple was down in Jerusalem, and God now judges them according to the law. Have you noticed that God never judged any of these other nations? on that basis whatsoever, that he judged them for certain specific sins they committed, sins that are common to mankind today that is in sin. But the other nations did not have God's law, and therefore they were not judged according to God's law. And he says here, I will send a fire upon Judah and it'll devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now, you will find that again and again, he mentions, as the other prophets do, the fact that there is to be a judgment by fire. And you'll find that running, actually, not only through this prophecy, but you find it running through the other prophets. And when Nebuchadnezzar came, he burned Jerusalem to the ground. Absolutely burned it. Nothing left but the stones that were there. And, of course, there were plenty of stones in that particular place. Now, that is something that he's delivering now. That is, Amos is delivering up in Bethel, and he's speaking in the king's chapel. Now, I think that probably every time he got up to speak, he'd take up one of these nations and he would pronounce God's judgment upon it. But he gets now to Judah, and that's getting pretty close to home. Maybe a few squirmed in their pew when he mentioned Judah. But after all, the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes were at war a great deal of the time. There were several times when they made alliances, but they only made them because of fear and of necessity to stand against a common enemy. But most of the time, why, they were enemies. And therefore, when Amos gave his message of judgment against the southern kingdom, everyone was present and amened him for that, because they were in agreement that God should judge Jerusalem and Judah. But now the northern kingdom. What about the northern kingdom? Now he's going to speak to them. And beginning here with verse 6, he's speaking to the northern kingdom. And Bethel, Bethel, if you want it pronounced that way, Bethel is the capital, and the king was there, and this man was 
speaking in the king's chapel. We are told that later on. We've already seen that. And now he's going to start meddling. He's getting close at hand. It's like the old story that we heard about. The preacher one Sunday morning was preaching about different sins of drinking. And this woman sitting in the congregation, she amended him and preached about the sin of smoking. And she amended him for that and for the sin of cussing. And she amended him for that. And finally, he got around. He began to talk about gossiping. And she says, he started meddling now. And friends, Amos is starting to meddle now. He's going to talk about his congregation that's before him now. It's not going to be the sins of the Moabites. This is the sin of the northern kingdom. They too had God's law. They had the commandments of God. They had the word of God. Now listen to him as he speaks in verse 6, Thus saith the Lord. And may I say to you, I personally have never felt that I have any right to stand in the pulpit and speak unless I can speak on the basis of thus saith the Lord. My feeling is that that's the basis of all Ministry. What does the Word of God have to say? Thus saith the Lord. Now listen to him here. For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I'll not turn away its punishment. But there are more than that, and believe me, he mentions more than that. Now he's going to deal actually with the Mosaic law. He's not dealing here with the commandments as he did with Judah. But he's dealing with these commandments that have to do with a man's everyday life. Now, first of all, he says, "...because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes." Now, the interesting thing is that a great deal is said here about the poor. The ten tribes in the north now... They had the law, but they were committing the sins of the nations that were round about them. Fact of the matter is, we'll see that the very people that God put out of that land, why, they were committing the same sins. Now, first of all, you have here the mistreatment of the poor. And you'll find out that he has a great deal to say about the poor. If you turn over to the fourth chapter... Verse 1, Hear the word, ye cows of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy. And then again in chapter 5 and verse 11, and will you listen to this? For as much therefore as your treading is upon the poor. Now, I've called attention to this time and again in the prophets, that the poor are not going to get justice, nor will they be treated fair on this earth until Christ reigns. The only hope of the poor is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry to say that, but we are told today that certain political parties will take care of the poor. Well, they've been taking care of us, all right, friends. Every time another one comes along and tells how much he's going to help me, I listen to him, and then my taxes go up. And they've been going up and up and up. And I'll be very frank with you. I find out that most of these men are rich men. We have too many rich men, not just lawyers today in Congress. We have too many millionaires there. And they don't know my problem. They don't understand me. They don't understand the poor. And I'm thankful as one someday that's going to take over for the poor. Now, God will judge a nation for its mistreatment of the poor. Now, somebody says, well, was there any law on this? There certainly was. Let me read you just one, and I could give several. In verse 19 of Chapter 16 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 16, 19. 
Listen to this. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. God put this law to protect the poor. In that day, a man might be absolutely innocent, but his adversary would slip something under the table to the judge. And by the way, that practice doesn't seem to be out of style today. Styles change, but not this one. That thing is still done. And it's difficult today for the poor, you see, to get justice when money today seems to be the determining factor. May I say to you, this man is speaking to a very pertinent problem of his day. And even a pair of shoes would pervert judgment and cause the poor to have to suffer. Then, not only that, by the way, but I come down here to verse 7, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. And what does that mean? Well, it could mean several things. Personally, I think it means that these selfish, these greedy judges and rich even resented that the poor had enough dust left to throw on their heads in mourning. Believe me, that is the modern idolatry also. That is covetousness today. And we see a great deal of that about. And God judges nations for that, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek, and a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. And apparently, he's talking about a maid that's a prostitute. And both the father and the son went in to them. And God says that adultery profanes his holy name. May I say to you, the new morality today wasn't new at all. Israel was practicing the new morality. But God said that he hated it, and he had put down laws specifically concerning this type of thing, and they were breaking over these. You can see this preacher's not going to be popular, friends. Amos was not really a very popular preacher in his day. He took the side of the poor, and he condemned unrighteousness. He condemned the injustice. He condemned the fact that the poor were getting a bad deal, and he condemned immorality. Not only that, listen to him, he's not through. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar. And did you know that God had a very lovely law in that particular connection? I think I have time to turn and read that. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 12, listen to this. And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. In any case, thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down that he may sleep in his own raiment, and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God. Now, a man very poor, he had nothing to put up, you know, for a very small loan as collateral, except his outer garment. And that's what he needed to keep him warm. God says, you can take it, but when the sun goes down, you let him have it back in order that he might not be cold and sleeping that night. Now, God says, you've been breaking over at that point. You have disobeyed me. And as a result, he says, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. And this is by every altar. I should mention that, which means there was only one altar that God had established in Jerusalem, in the temple. This speaks of they had turned to idolatry, and now he's condemning drunkenness. Now, we're coming back to drunkenness again, and I'll not enlarge on that today at all. Well, we'll see that next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. 
Now I want to come to our study today, and I'd gotten down to the ninth verse of the second chapter of Amos, and he's now speaking directly to the congregation that's out in front of him. He did speak about the sins of the Moabites, but now he's going to talk about the sins of the Israelites, and they are the ones that are listening to him there. And he's not making himself very popular because he mentions the specific sins of which they are guilty, and those were the sins of immorality, injustice, and blasphemy, and he spells them out for them. They were mistreating the poor. God notes that. There's so much in the Word of God concerning that. The Lord Jesus could rejoice that the poor had the gospel preached to them. And he speaks of the fact that they couldn't get justice before the judges of that day because the judges were accepting a bribe from the rich one in the case that was probably suing them. And naturally, the poor were not getting justice. And he mentions the fact that justice was being turned aside in disfavor to the meek of the earth. The meek were in disfavor. Why? Because they didn't speak out. The fact of the matter is, the old saying is true, that it's the squeaking wheel that gets the grease. And the meek are not inheriting the earth today. It's the forward and those that are grabbing all they can. And therefore, God is saying he'll judge them because of the fact that they are not giving justice to the poor and to the meek. He condemns them for their immorality, for adultery. He condemns them for the fact of idolatry because they were taking pledges by every altar. And that means that Israel had only one altar, and it was in Jerusalem. Now they were in idolatry, and they were breaking the Mosaic law because God says you can't take a man's coat as a pledge. You can't use it as collateral because you're taking away that garment which keeps him warm. And we talk about how just our laws are today. And it's permitted today to absolutely move an entire family out of a house when they cannot pay the rent because of poverty, by the way. And the Word of God has a great deal to say in behalf of the poor. Then he condemns drunkenness here. Now, he's coming back to that And I have something more to say when we get to that, because that is the great sin of our nation today. Now, in verse 9, God says, "...yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath." God likens the Amorite here using now the language of this man, this country bumpkin that's come up from Tekoa, way down yonder in the desert in Judah. And it is figurative and expressive language that he is using here. He's tall like the cedar. He's strong like the oak. But God said, I destroyed him. I destroyed the fruit above. I destroyed the roots from beneath. Now, God got rid of the Amorite. That's exactly what we have in the book of Joshua. In the 24th chapter of Joshua, verse 8, he says, "...and I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side Jordan, and they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand, that ye might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you." Now, we said last time there are no Moabites around today. I don't think you've seen one recently. And I wonder when the last time was that you saw an Amorite, when God put them in the land. You remember he had said way back yonder to Abraham, he said, now, I can't put you in the land right now because the Amorite is in the land and his iniquity is not yet full. That is, God says, I'm going to give him an opportunity to turn to me, to turn from these gross sins that he was committing. 
and I am going to give him an opportunity. Now, someone is going to say to me, well, Dr. McGee, after all, these heathen nations didn't have the Mosaic law, and they didn't know. There's a very interesting statement that Paul makes in Romans, the second chapter. And I think probably I ought to turn and read that. He says in the second chapter of Romans, verse 12, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Well, now, why would they refrain from murder? Why would they refrain from lying? Why would they refrain from stealing? Well, listen to Paul. Now, I continue to read here, Romans 2, verse 15 which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You and I have a conscience, and if we'd never heard of the Ten Commandments, it would either accuse us or excuse us. We'd either say, I'm guilty, or we'd make some excuse for breaking it so that the Gentiles, man has had a sense, he's been given that, of that which is right and that which is wrong. And it was on that basis that God judged the Amorite. He continued in sin. And God says, I'm going to put you down in Egypt, told Abraham that, that is his offspring, for 420 years. Now, friends, I don't think the most rabid liberal would want to ask God to give more than 420 years. Now, if you feel like 421 years would have been better, then I'm sure the Lord must have made a mistake. But I personally will go along with the Lord that when you give a nation 420 years to decide what to do, that they've had a long enough time. Well, the fact of the matter is the Amorite didn't turn to God. Now, when... Joshua crossed over. He came into the land of the Amorites. Jericho was an Amorite city. And this woman that was there, the harlot Rahab, she was an Amorite. These people were destroyed. Now, the Moabites disappeared, but you have Ruth, the Moabitess, in the genealogy of Christ. Now, you have Rahab, the harlot, in the genealogy of Christ. But the Amorites have long since disappeared. Now God says, I judge them for committing the same sins that you are committing, and I have given you my law, and you have broken it. Now, verse 10, Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt, led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite, and I raised up of your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. It is not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord. Now, God says that I wanted you to serve me in that land. I wanted you to bring up your young men to serve me, to be prophets and to be Nazarites. Now, what happened? Verse 12, now, chapter 2 of Amos, "...but ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not." This was the picture that we have here. Now, a Nazarite was an Israelite who took a vow that he did voluntarily. He'd be dedicated to God. Three things that he did. First, he didn't cut his hair. Now, he was really the first hippie that there was. And why? Because for a man to have long hair, Paul says, it's a shame to him. And when I look around me today and see some of the fellows that I see, I agree with Paul that it's sort of a shame for a man to have long hair. But we've long since passed 
that, and it's not my business, and I don't try to tell anybody how to cut their hair. But I'm just telling you that the Nazarites let their hair grow because they were willing to bear shame. Now, the second thing, they were not permitted to drink wine or touch any fruit of the vine, not even raisins. They were not to eat grapes. Now, there are some that have tried to say the Lord Jesus was a Nazarite. He was not. They actually called him a wine bibber, and he made wine there at the feast yonder in Cana of Galilee, a wedding feast. Now, I'm going to come back, though, to this matter of drunkenness a little later on. They were breaking a vow when they gave the Nazarites wine. And then the Nazarite was not to touch a dead body or come near it. That is, when one of his loved ones died, he didn't even attend the funeral. Why? Well, because he's putting God first, and that's an evidence of it. Now they said to the prophets, prophesy not. They say to the prophets, we don't want to hear you. We don't want to have any message from you at all. They wouldn't listen to the prophets. May I make an analogy to our own nation today? I was talking to a man who has been a history professor in a college. He was telling me that he was very much interested in the statement we made in Daniel that our nation today is following the pattern that Rome followed when Rome went down. You see, Rome was never destroyed from the outside. And I've never believed that there is coming a missile over the North Pole that will destroy this country. I think that the missile that will destroy us today is this propaganda that is abroad, that we have now become a sophisticated, very progressive nation, and we're a great nation, and nothing can happen to us. We are probably going down as fast as any nation. A leading statesman says this nation has gone down faster in the past ten years than it did in its entire history from its inception. And that, of course, is true today. And one of the things, in fact, two of them, and we'll deal with both of them later, one of them, of course, is drunkenness. There happen to be 10 million alcoholics in this country today. One half of the accidents that take place in Southern California are drunk drivers involved. And we today say we shouldn't say anything about it but we are to make laws concerning the use and abuse of drugs. And I agree with those laws. But what about liquor, friends? That's the thing today that's destroying us as a nation. And then the other thing that characterizes us today is that we're not hearing the Word of God. The liberal preacher today is the popular preacher. And if they're going to have anybody on TV, it will be the liberal preacher. They had a panel discussion on abortion. They had a minister there. You guessed it, he was a liberal, and I mean a liberal. They had a discussion about women's rights. They had a preacher on there. You were right again, he was a liberal. They never ask a Bible-preaching preacher today to voice anything. And we talk about religious liberty. My friend today, the voice of God is not being heard in this land, except a few of us weak fellows that are around trying to declare the Word of God. Now, that's what they were doing in Israel. They said, at least Amos says, you're giving the Nazarite wine, causing him to break his vow and turning him from God. And you're saying to the prophet, prophesy not. You say to me, Don't talk like that. We want to hear something that'll butter us up, make us feel good. Now listen to him. He's not through. Verse 13, he says, Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. Now, there are different ways of interpreting this. In fact, I'm told different ways of translating it. And that it's the belief of some that it's rather degrading to think of God as being pressed down like a cart. Well, I don't feel that way about it. My feeling is that God is saying here, you have put me in a difficult situation. You are my people. I put you in the land, and I put the Amorite out. 
Now, here you are committing the same sins they are. Do you expect me to shut my eyes to you because you're my people? I'm being pressed down. Verse 14, Therefore the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. Now, there are some expositors that believe that this refers to that earthquake we'd heard about before. I don't think so. I don't think there's any reference here to an earthquake at all. What I think is just simply this, that they were a strong nation, and God kept the enemy out, and none ever advanced into their land. Now, everything is breaking down. The walls of the cities, the enemies come in, and the strong are no longer strong, and those that handle the bow. I think that probably we ought, as a nation, to do a little thinking about what has happened in our land. We were able, in two world wars, to cross the sea and to bring an end to two world wars. We became, in that, a great nation. And we were very proud. We didn't need God at all. We had the atom bomb. And then a little country called North Vietnam. We thought that we would subdue them overnight. One of the presidents in the early 60s, why, he began to send troops in. Then the next president did, and then on. And I'm not attempting to fix blame on any president, but I do say that America should have learned a lesson we did not win a victory, and we were never able to subdue the little enemy. Now, it is true that we did not want to bring the full force to bear, but it reveals the fact that we are becoming weak as a nation, and we were divided at home. Maybe somebody ought to wake up today, and instead of shutting our eyes to the condition of our land, that we ought to begin to call attention to it, that God is already beginning to bring us down as a nation as he brought his own people down. He said, you're becoming weak, and you don't seem to realize that I'm moving now, and I'm beginning to judge you. That is the message that is there. And no wonder they wanted to run Amos out of town. No wonder they didn't want to hear his message but say he's not through. Now, in chapter 3, he's going to bring all of the nation together. God's charge now is against the whole house of Israel, the twelve tribes, though they're divided. Listen to him. Hear this word, that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. God ignored the fact that they were split. Now he says, I'm speaking to the whole family that I brought up. And you're not two nations. You're one, one family before me. And he says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Now that's getting right down where the rubber meets the road. And that's the kind of prophet Amos was. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't mince words. He says, God will punish you for your iniquities. And you know what? God did. This man happened to be right. It's too bad the politicians and the priests didn't listen to him. If they had, it could have been a different story. Now, this chapter deals with the twelve tribes of Israel. God's judgment upon the two nations, both Judah and Israel. They were separate, and they are treated that way in chapter 2. But now in chapter 3, the judgment is pronounced upon the twelve tribes, those that came out of the Assyrian captivity, those that came out of the Babylonian captivity. He calls them the whole family. 
And here now is that family he brought out of Egypt. They are divided now, the northern and southern kingdom. Now, in verse 2, he says, "...you only have I known of all the families of the earth." And I take it, of the nations of the earth. In other words, the sin of man after the flood was such that man at the Tower of Babel had departed from God. It was total apostasy at that time. And then God reached down in Ur of the Chaldees and called a man to get away from a home of idolatry and go to a place he'd show him. And he'd make of that man a nation and give him a land. Now, that's what he means here. You only have I known. In other words, in order to get a message through to the world, God had to use this method because at the Tower of Babel, Man had totally rejected God. And the Tower of Babel was not built to get man up above the flood stage of water. That was never the point. It was an altar that was built, apparently, to the sun. And you can understand why. Because they had come through a flood, and they felt that the God that had brought the flood was the God of darkness, the God of the storm. And now they're going to worship the sun. And you find out that that was the worship that prevailed in that Tigris-Euphrates Valley. Actually, to this very day, the worship of the sun. And you have the worship of light under Zoroastrianism, even down to the present day. Now, after the flood, God chose this man. And now he takes a nation in order that he might use this nation to get a word. And he's giving the word through this nation. And finally, this word is to go to the world. And that's the reason that we're on the radio given the total Bible is because we believe that this is God's message for the world today. Not just John 3.16, as wonderful as that is, but his message for the world is Not John 3.16 only, but 66 books of the Bible. And all of those books, we believe we need to know it all. Now, he says, "...you only have I known of the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities." Now, God says, "...I intend to judge you." Now, the nation Israel occupied this unique relationship to God. God gave them the commandments. That was the reason that he said he judged Judah. I gave you the commandments. And God judged Israel because of the fact that they had broken so many of the commandments. And you see, light always creates responsibility. A privilege creates a greater responsibility than when a nation is in darkness. And this is the great principle that God puts down here. It is that he intends to judge those that have received light in a harsher manner than he would judge others. You know, the Lord Jesus mentioned the fact that some would receive few stripes, others more stripes. And my friend, I've made this statement many times as a pastor. I would rather be a heathen hottentot in the darkest corner of this earth, bowing down before a stone idol that is ugly and hideous. I'd rather be that hottentot than to be a civilized, so-called man in this country, who sits in a church on Sunday morning and hears the gospel and do nothing about it. That man that hears the word has a greater responsibility than the man out yonder. And that means there are different degrees of punishment, by the way. And now he makes it very clear that he intends to punish them for your iniquities. Now, a great many... They like to hear about the love of God, and it's wonderful. 
And I don't think anyone's emphasized the love of God more than we have. I think that it's something that we need to rest upon, and it's something that we need to rejoice in. But we need to recognize also that when the love of God is rejected as it's manifested in the cross of Christ, because actually that's the only place you really see the love of God, when he gave his Son, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. That's where he revealed it. And when that love is rejected, then nothing is left but punishment. Now, a great many people don't think God ought to punish. But since they are not running the universe, I'm of the opinion that their viewpoint will not be followed. Nor I do not think God will listen to it. God already says that he's a holy, righteous, just God, and he intends to punish. We have here, beginning with verse 3, a very interesting set of questions. In fact, there are seven questions that are asked and answered, and these questions are quite logical and reveals what a matter-of-fact prophet Amos really was. This man got right down, friends, to the place where two plus two equals four. He got right down where you and I live today. And here we find him dealing with certain great truths. And actually, as others have pointed out, what you have here, this man Amos, who was from the country, way down yonder in Tekoa, in the wilderness, he draws from his long experience down there these lessons in nature, in the natural world. And he learns something that a great many folk need to learn today that do not really know where a great many things come from. I never shall forget when my daughter was growing up here in Pasadena at a school, they took them out to a dairy. And she came home with the most exciting news that you've ever heard, friend. She told us that milk came from a cow. She thought that you got it over at the market, that you just reached in and took out a bottle or a paper carton of milk, and that's where it originated. It was an amazing fact. Well, this man, Amos, he's a countryman. He knows a great deal about nature. And it reveals he'd observe things. Now he's going to mention some of them as we go along. The first question is this. Can two walk together? Can two walk together? Yes. Except they be agreed. They can't go together if they're not in agreement. I watched a young couple the other day. Haven't been married long. And they were walking down the street arm in arm. And all of a sudden, she turned around and stamped her little foot and started walking back toward their home. And he kept going. They weren't walking together. There's something that happened. They'd had a disagreement. Probably one of their first fights, by the way. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Here is a cause and an effect. The cause is there must be agreement if you're to walk together with God. And the result will be, if you're to walk with him, there must be agreement. Now, that doesn't mean that God's going to come over and agree with you. You and I will have to come over and agree with him. Someone has said that God rides triumphantly in his own chariot. And if you don't want to get under the wheels of those chariots, you better get aboard and ride. After all, God is carrying through his purpose in the world. You and I got here pretty late, you know. And frankly, we're not going to be here very long. So your will and my will, it will not prevail at all. I was very much interested in visiting in England those castles at Windsor Court, at Windsor Castle, Hampton Court where Henry VIII, and I think of poor Henry VI, and I think of Richard II. Some of those boys made a trip to the tower 
lost their heads there. The very interesting thing is they had their way for a little while, Henry did, but nobody's paying attention about what Henry VIII thought or what he did. My friend, may I say to you that if you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to go his way. Now, let's keep moving. That's the first question, and it's a great principle that is put down here. How can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, the second question is, verse 4, Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Of course not. A lion, you know, goes through the forest stealthily, quietly, silently, padded feet never even crushes or breaks a limb. And then when he pounces on his prey and has his prey, you can hear him roar. He's not going to roar unless he gets his prey. And the other is, will a young lion cry out of his den if he's taken nothing? No, the little lion, he doesn't make a sound. His mama told him to keep quiet while she was away getting something for him to eat, getting his supper. And when she comes back with it and he sees it, then he lets out a real squeal, and at that time he lets out a cry, but not tell then. You see, there is always a cause and a result, and the judgment of God follows man's iniquity, and it will follow. Now, We come to the fourth question. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no trap is for him? Of course not. That's perfect nonsense to say that you can catch a bird by... And they told me as a boy that if you just put salt on their tail, you could catch them. And as a kid, I ran all over the whole neighborhood trying to get salt on a bird's tail. But didn't work. And the problem was the same principle that is here. You can't catch the bird without a trap, you see. And in nature, there is always this principle that is followed, cause and effect. If you're going to catch a bird, you're going to have to have a trap. Now, we have another one here. Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing in it at all? A man's not just going to keep setting a trap if he's not catching anything. I used to have six traps as a boy, and I would ride down on my bicycle every morning before school in the fall of the year to see if I'd caught anything. And generally in six traps, one of them would have a possum in it, maybe a rabbit, and sometimes a skunk, and I gave the skunk always to a friend of mine, and he went down and got it. You could get more for the fur, but I didn't care for the scent. And so when I had a trap in a place, and day after day, nothing was in it, why, that's foolish to leave it there. I moved it to some other place. If you're going to put out a trap now, you expect to catch something in the trap. Now, the sixth verse here, "...shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid?" When there is a sound of alarm given, are people not going to be afraid? Now, God has said he's going to judge the people, and judgment is coming. It's rather foolish not to respond to that, that there be an effect from that, you see. And that we're not listening to the problem any more than this nation is listening to the Word of God today. Then shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it. Now, the word evil here does not mean that which is sinful or wrong. It means calamity, our judgment for that matter. And shall there be a calamity in the city? And that means, friends, that always in this world, as far as God's children are concerned, there's no such thing as an accident. No such thing as an accident. For a child of God today, there must be a cause for the effect. There has to be. And God is not moving this universe today in some foolish, idle manner. And therefore, when there's a calamity, 
there ought to be a lesson learned from it. I believe that if America had learned the lesson of the Dust Bowl and of the drought period and the Depression, that we would never have had to fight World War II. We just didn't listen. And we didn't listen in World War II. And then we went to Vietnam. And we are not listening today at all. And my friend, if you think prosperity is just around the corner, may I say to you, we haven't come to that corner yet. God will not let any nation dwell in peace and prosperity when they're in sin. Oh, they may have a period of it, but judgment will come. Now, friends, this man Amos asked seven questions that actually pertain to what we would call the natural world, the world of nature, and they illustrate the fact that for every effect there is a cause and that the judgment of God that's coming is not accidental or it's not a whim on his part, nor is he being peevish at all, but it is a result that has been caused by the sin of the people. Now, verse 7, he makes this statement. He says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Now, the fact of the matter is that God will not move in judgment until he gives his message to the prophets. He'll let them know what he intends to do. And the prophets have been given the message, and they are to give it. Verse 8 says, "...the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy." Now, this has been the method of the Lord, that he has spoken always. He's given a warning concerning judgment that is coming. He has also told to those that are his own something concerning the future. And especially when judgment is coming, why God has always given a warning to mankind. And it's not because people today do not have a word from God. The problem is they will not hear that word from God. And we find here that he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Now, today, those things are revealed in the word of God. I feel that this book is as up-to-date as tomorrow morning's paper because tomorrow morning's paper will be out of date by noon when the afternoon edition comes out. But the Word of God then will be good for the next day, and on and on. God's method has been this way. Now, you will recall that during Noah's day, God had this man Noah preach for 120 years about a flood that was coming as a judgment from God. And the world did not heed that message. Now, he, you remember, let Abraham know ahead of time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's a good thing that he did that, because if he hadn't have done that, there'd have been a great deal of misunderstanding. And as a result, Abraham would have got a wrong viewpoint of Almighty God. It's been God's method to reveal things like that. He told his own yonder in the upper room. He says, "...henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you." That's John fifteen fifteen. In other words, the Lord Jesus himself says that, The Spirit of God is going to tell you about things to come. And he gave forewarning to Joseph of the years of famine that were coming down in Egypt. That has been God's method. Elijah walked into the courts of Ahab and Jezebel and said, You're in for a drought because there'll not be rain or dew these years except by my word. And I'm not saying anything, I'm leaving. 
and he walked out of the court so that our Lord could tell his apostles yonder when he was gathered with them on the Mount of Olives in the Olivet Discourse. He told them about the coming destruction of Jerusalem, that it would be destroyed, not one stone would be left upon another. So it's been God's method to do that. And that's all that Amos is saying here. You see, they've been highly critical of him. He says, I want you to know that the Lord reveals his secrets. He lets you know that judgment is coming. And you wouldn't feel bad. Well, you'd feel bad, but you'd appreciate it if your doctor would tell you what your physical condition really is. I have a very wonderful cancer specialist that I went to, and he told me I had cancer and what I should do. And I still go for x-rays, and then I'll wait for his report. And he'll tell me the truth, what it has to say. It's strange that people today want to do like the proverbial ostrich, stick our heads in the sand, and we don't want to hear the bad news of judgment that is coming. They say, you're a pessimist, you're a killjoy, you're a gloom caster. But may I say to you that... God follows a certain principle that for every effect there's a cause, and God never sends judgment unless there has been the sin of the people. Now, he makes it also very clear that the prophet is obligated to. In fact, he ought to be in fear, be very frank with you. I feel sorry today for the liberal who's refusing to declare God's message. He makes it clear here, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? God has spoken. Now let's give his word out. Let's speak what God has to say. And let's get off of this social gospel. Well, it's sort of like being on dope. We're on a trip of sweetness and light, rose water and sunshine. Everything's going to work out nice today. Well, I've been told that all my life by politicians and preachers, that the pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow, and we're going to arrive shortly. Well, I've been on this trip a long ways most of this century, and we haven't arrived yet. It gets worse and worse, and they won't face up to what the real problem is. Now, notice as he moves on, he says, "...publish in the palaces at Ashdod." Now, Ashdod is down in Philistia, in the country of the Philistines. By the way, today, Israel has it. They built apartments there like mad. And they have built a harbor there. It's a man-made harbor. A big refinery is built there, and they're bringing the oil into Ashdod today. It's rather amusing. I remember that a friend of mine who teaches prophecy... He likes to find fulfillments of prophecy today, and I don't think it's being fulfilled. You remember Moses said that Asher would dip his foot in oil. Well, Haifa, way up in the northern part of Israel, that place was where the oil pipeline came in. And there was a refinery there, the big oil tanks, and the tankers were out there loading up. A friend of mine says, see, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Well... Today, that pipeline has been cut. No oil is coming into Haifa at all, except that which is brought in by tankers. But down now in Ashdod, they have a pipeline across the Negev, and it is brought by tankers in on the other side into the Red Sea side. And then it is piped across to this refinery in Ashdod. And it looks like it would be the tribe of Dan that dipped his foot in oil today. And my friend, quite interestingly, he's forgotten all about this fulfillment of prophecy. You see, that's the foolishness of today, of being rather picky unish and picking out these petty things as if they're fulfillment of prophecy today. I personally do not think prophecies being fulfilled in that land at all. I do see the setting of a stage that will later on bring the fulfillment of prophecy, but not today. So that what we have here is Ashdod, 
but not as it is today. Ashdod was then a prominent city in Philistia among the Philistines. And he says now, let this word go out to them and also in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumults in the midst of her and the oppressed in the midst of her. Now, Samaria, it's in a most beautiful location. I know of no more wonderful spot to build a palace than there was there. And that's where Ahab and Jezebel were. And Omri had really been the one to build a city, and he was the father of Ahab. And sin had become so rampant, so out in the open. You see, they had the new morality going there, great guns and There were hills all around. I'd call them hills. They called them mountains. But now God says, all right, all of you people from Ashdod, all of you from Egypt, come up and watch these people, how they are sinned and turned from the Lord. Verse 10, for they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. In other words, They're bringing in the booty there of that which they've been stealing. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. And the palaces of Samaria, they're in ruins today. We'll say more about them in just a minute. Now, notice verse 12. Thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out to dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus on a couch. In other words, they were going up to Damascus, and I have a notion what he really means, they go up there to commit adultery because of the fact that was a very sinful nation. And God says... Just as a shepherd, he kills a lion, like you remember David said he did. A lion that got into the flock, and he killed a sheep. And all that's left is a couple legs there and an ear of the lamb. It's been killed and eaten. God says, that's the way I intend to destroy the northern kingdom. You see, their responsibility was great because they had light from heaven. Verse 13, Hear ye, and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall judge the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also judge the altars of Bethel. That is, where the golden calf. God said, I will judge it. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. God says, I intend to remove that. Now, will you listen to verse 15, the last verse here of chapter 3? And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Now, what does he mean by the houses of ivory? Well, Ahab and Jezebel had built there in Samaria, which is a city, on top of this hill, most beautiful location, they had built there a tremendous palace. You can see the ruins of it today. It covers a great deal of ground, and it was built in a place, and I particularly noticed that this time. I didn't the first time. That that palace covers the very brow of the hill, the very top of the hill, the tip-top of the hill, so that from their palace... They could look in every direction. If they looked toward the west, they could see the Mediterranean Sea on a clear day. And if they looked to the east, they could see the Jordan Valley. If they looked to the north, they could see the valley of Esdraelon and Mount Hermon in the distance. If they looked to the south, they could see Jerusalem. What a view! Now, they built there a palace of ivory. Of course... The enemy in days gone by has carted away that beautiful ivory that went there. But excavations have been going on there recently. In fact, Israel 
is excavating there. And our guide told us that they have found several very delicate vessels of ivory. Apparently, one of them was for perfume, and uh, other vessels probably for wine. So that ivory was the color scheme, if you please, of the palace. Everything was done in ivory. Apparently, Ab and Jezebel had the best interior decorator of the period to come up and decorate for them. It was a place of luxury. But God says, it'll perish, and I will destroy it and bring it to an end. And I do not know of a more desolate spot than the ruins of Samaria on top of that hill today. I say to you today, friends, that God has certainly fulfilled prophecy. You will not see prophecy being fulfilled in that land, but you can see prophecy that has been fulfilled in that land, and you can see prophecy that's going to be fulfilled in that land and the stage being set. But I still insist we're not seeing the fulfillment of prophecy over there today.